Yeah, we're running a little late here. Okay. All set. Thank you, Tyler. All right, good evening. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1? Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. Good evening to all, all of you and the people on Pal Talk and those who might be viewing this class or listening through the website. We're going to continue with our study of Daniel chapter 2 this evening by noting verse 24. And in this verse, uh, Daniel requests that Arioch not execute the wise men. And t- he also requests that Arioch escort him to the king in order to reveal the interpretation of the king's dream. So uh, we're going to talk about, as we left off last evening, we're going to talk a lot about the w- love of God here this evening. Because Daniel actually intervenes for the wise men and he had every right to say nothing about those guys and let them be executed, but he doesn't do that. So he's demonstrating, as we'll see this evening, the love of God. And uh, where God's uh, love, with God's love, you love your enemies, just like Jesus taught and exemplified for us at the cross. So with that in mind, with our, uh, let's prepare ourselves. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for another beautiful day out here in Iowa, the nice, uh, mild, warm weather. And uh, evidently, it's, uh, we're going to have another one tomorrow. So we thank you, Father, for that and uh, that we can enjoy the outdoors today. We thank you, Father, for uh, the privilege that you've given us and the, uh, to study your word and to learn of your plan to become like your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for all the wonderful invisible assets that we received at the moment of our conversion and the Holy Spirit, all that he's done in our lives from regeneration to resurrection. We look forward to the day that we're in resurrection bodies and we'll be perfected. We just thank you, Father, for giving us a, a confident expectation of blessing in the future, not only in relation to the, the resurrection body, but rewards if we're faithful here in time. Father, we thank you for this study in the book of Daniel. We pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to guide us and direct us in this study. And this evening, we pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through both the audience and the communicator. We thank you, Father, for uh, Titus and uh, Tyler and uh, their work on the sound and recordings. We pray that we wouldn't have any problems with the technology. We pray that you would help everyone in the audience to learn, to understand what's being taught and put it into practice, to guide them in the application of it in their own lives. We also pray that you would strengthen myself, empower me to deliver your people your full counsel so that they are built up and edified, and you and your son, Jesus Christ, are lifted up and glorified. So, Father, we pray for these people and things, in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 is where you should all be, and as I've been doing, I'm going to insert uh, my uh, corrected translation. When I need to change the translation, I will do so, and insert my translation and the explanation, reasons, for the change in the translation, you can get it on the website with the download the uh, exegesis and exposition of these verses, previous verses, in, uh, in quite an extensive, exhaustive detail. And also we have the audio and video of, of all these classes that we've done in the past. And uh, so uh, therefore, I'm just going, without giving any explanation, I will just correct the translation as I see fit. So look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, and this is in the second century, uh, sixth century BC, and this is the second regnal year of Nebuchadnezzar. It's not, uh, this is not talking about his ascension year, it's talking about his regnal year, the first, first, full, first full year in office. Then it says Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and this was a recurring dream, it was on more than one occasion he had this dream, and as we'll see, it was a revelation from God about future events. And then it says, and his soul was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the occult priests, the uh, necromancers, the witches, and the astrologers to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my soul is anxious to understand the dream. Then the astrologers spoke to the king in Aramaic. Remember, they're the spokesperson for the other three groups. They said to him, O king, live forever. Tell the content of the dream to your servants, and then we will declare the interpretation. And the king replied or responded to the astrologers, The command for me is irrevocable. If you do not make known to me the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb, you'll be dismembered, and your homes will be made a rubbish heap. 
However, or on the other hand, if you declare the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. And he fulfilled that promise with Daniel, of course. Therefore, based upon these two statements in verses 6 and verse 5, declare to me the content of the dream, as well as its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the content of the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. And the king replied, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time, and because you have seen that the command for me is irrevocable. So he's being adamant here, the king is, that if you, verse 9, that if you do not make known the content of the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have conspired... Maybe we should start again. I don't know. Even how it was on. Yeah. Did you hear me? Did you hear me in the th- off by, You were off by 20 seconds, 23 seconds. Really? Hmm. I had it on. I looked at the light. It was on. Yeah, I saw it too. Now it, it's, it's flickering here. Put new batteries in it. Hmm. Okay. Huh. Yeah, it was blinking. I knew I had it on. Well, let's hopefully that doesn't act up. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks for catching that, guys. All right, so we have it. We're at, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 9, he says, the king uh, says to, uh, uh, to the, the, uh, the wise men, he says that if you do not make known to me the content of the dream, there's only one decree for you. If you have conspired together to speak lying, corrupt words, before me until the situation is changed, till I change my mind, and he has no intention of doing that. Then it says, therefore, tell me the content of the dream, and here's the purpose, in order that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. So he'll be assured that they can interpret dreams if they could tell him the content of the dream, and uh, he knows this because that would be a supernatural act. That would, in, that would be tantamount to reading his mind, as we said. Then it goes on to say in verse 10, the astrologers answered the king and said, there's not a man or a person on the face of the earth who could declare the matter for the king. Consequently, no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any occult priest, necromancer, or astrologer. Indeed, the demand which the king is exacting is impossible. And there's no one else who could declare it to the king except the gods whose dwelling place is not with the human race. Then he says in verse 12, because of this, because of what they said to him, he's furious. The king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to execute each and every one of the city of Babylon's wise men. So the decree, the order went forth that the wise men should be slain and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. So Daniel and his friends would be considered a part of the wise men. Verse 14, then Daniel replied with wisdom and Wisdom intact to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the execute, the city of Babylon's wise men. He, he said to Arioch, the king's commander, for what reason is the order from the king so uncompromisingly severe? Not just urgent, it was uncompromisingly severe. Then it, says in, then it goes on to say, after this question, then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. He told Daniel about the matter, and of course he would do so because he had sympathy for the wise men as we saw. He respected them because they were in the same boot, boot, uh, boot, uh, boat as him, and that at any time the king could make an, un, a, a ridiculous demand of Arioch and have him executed. So he could identify with the wise men, he sympathized with them, he also respected these guys as we saw, as most people in Babylon did. Verse 16, so Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. And then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter so that they might request 
merciful acts from the God of heaven because of this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be executed with the rest of the city of Babylon's wise men. Then, verse 19, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, or as we saw, he showered adoring praise and thanksgiving upon the Father for answering his prayer request. Verse 20, Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. In other words, it's, a declar- it's not a request here, as we saw. It's a declarative statement, meaning that God has been praised in the past for his wisdom and power, and this will be the case in the future. Remember, we studied this in detail in the Aramaic. Verse 21, It is he who changes the times and the epochs, times referring to the appointed times. Epochs is the durations of time. Verse, uh, the very next statement, he goes on to describe God even further in his sovereignty. He removes kings and he establishes kings. Uh, That would be political leaders today. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and power in the form of the revelation that he received that's recorded in verses 31 through 45. It's a revelation of, of God's future program for planet Earth. Then he goes on to say, Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Verse 24, our subject this evening, our verse for this evening. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of the city of Babylon. And he went in and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Now, the very first statement in verse 24, it says, Therefore Daniel went into Arioch. In the original, we have the preposition key, and this is followed by the preposition lamed and the preposition kobel. They're used together to mark a cause. They're, it's a, they're, they're introducing a causal statement, presenting the reason for the previous statement. And this is a, accompanied by the demonstrative pronoun dana, which is translated here, uh, should be translated here, this. This is followed by the proper noun Daniel, referring to Daniel, of course. And then we have a verb. We have the al perfect form of the verb al al, which is translated here, went in. And then lastly, we have a prepositional phrase. We have once again the preposition lamed and the proper noun ariok which is referring to Arioch here, who is representing the king. Now, the preposition key, along with the prepositions Lamed and Kobel, and the demonstrative pronoun Dana, indicate that Daniel made these two requests of Arioch because the father had answered his prayer and revealed to him the content of the king's dream as well as his interpretation. So these, uh, the, the numeric and standard uh, translates these words with the phrase, therefore, which is not too bad, but I like to use because of this. That's a, a little bit more explicit, the causal idea. Now, the verb al-al, which translated went in by the numeric and standard, it means to approach. It refers to Daniel entering into the presence of Arioch in order to request that he spare the lives of the wise men and to escort him into the king's presence in order to reveal to him the content of his dream as well as its interpretation. And Arioch, uh, Arioch, he is uh, the captain of the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's bodyguard, bodyguard, and he's the chop executioner. He's the one who heads the execution of the wise men. Now remember, he's not only pr- uh, uh, responsible for the protection of the king, he's also the one who is responsible, uh, the, the chief officer who executes enemies of the state. So that's uh, this is this man's position. So we've seen Daniel come in contact with uh, quite uh, powerful individuals in the Babylonian government and handle himself quite well. He's dealt with, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, and also we saw Ashpenaz in chapter one, and uh, we now we see him with Arioch demonstrating great wisdom and tact. And remember, he received this wisdom and tact because he knew the Bible. He knew the Word of God as he had it. Now let's keep going in the verse. It says uh, in verse. Uh, in verse 24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch, and then it says, and to describe Arioch, whom the king had de- appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. So that phrase, the relative pronoun phrase, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, is identifying for the reader or reminding the reader who this guy Arioch is. Now that phrase, that relative pronoun phrase, is composed of the relative particle D, translated here, whom, correctly, referring to Arioch. And then we have a verb. We have the pa'al, excuse me, perfect form of the verb mena, which is translated here, 
appointed. And then we have the word for king, melech again, and a prepositional phrase follows it. We have the preposition lamed, and its object is the infinitive construct form of the verb abad. It means it's translated here correctly, destroy. In other words, it's talking about executing the wise men. It's referring to capital punishment, as we'll say. Then we have uh, completing the clause, we have the preposition lamed, followed by the noun kakim, translated here the wise men, and then the word for ba Babylon is the babel, and that's the proper noun babel. And it's referring to the city of Babylon, not the empire, not the, uh, the province of Babylon. It's actually talking about the city of Babylon. We Noted that quite a bit in detail. Now, when it says he had appointed uh, uh, Arioch to destroy the wise men of Babylon, again, the word uh, mana is uh, translated here, had appointed. It means to assign or appointed. It refers to Nebuchadnezzar assigning to Arioch the duty or the task of es executing the city of Babylon's wise men. Remember, he's doing this because the Nebuchadnezzar considers these wise men enemies of the state. And, uh, and remember what's interesting here. And we brought this out with Nebuchadnezzar. He, he actually gives an order that he's going to regret because he doesn't want to execute Daniel and his three friends. Remember chapter 1 says he really admired uh, Daniel and his three friends. He considered them smarter than the other guys in, uh, that were, uh, helped to compose his wise men. All Nebuchadnezzar wanted to execute was the guys who claimed to be in contact with the supernatural, which would be the occult priests, they translated magicians in, in a New American Standard. The necromancers, they're called the conjurers in the New American Standard. Uh, the witches, they're sorcerers in, in the New American Standard. And the Chaldeans is not talking about an ethnic group. Uh, it's talking about the astrologers. This is how the word was used in Aramaic. So we have those four groups. Those are the ones Nebuchadnezzar wanted to execute. Now the reason he gets so furious, so he gives an order where he says all the city of Babylon's wise men are going to be executed. That would include dignitaries and, and diplomats like Daniel and his three friends who had no connection to the occult priests, the witches, the astrologers, and the uh, necromancers. He had, they had nothing to do with those guys. In fact, they would, uh, they would stay away from their practices because Daniel and his three friends were com uh, prohibited from engaging in the practices of the witches and the astrologers and the occult priests and the necromancers. Now, the word trans uh, the phrase dis to destroy, that's translating the verb abad, which is translated here correctly. It can be translated to execute, to kill, and it's used of capital punishment here, referring to the execution of Nebuchadnezzar's wise men. So remember, capital punishment, it comes from God. He is the one who uh, uh, he declared it in, in Genesis 9-6 when Noah came out of the ark. Uh, part of the Noahic covenant was that God was going to establish human government. He would delegate authority to men, and the government's chief job as we saw it right off the bat, and we saw it in Romans 13, is to execute criminals, murderers. That's what they should be doing. And when they don't do that, they're failing as servants of God, and God, Jesus Christ, who is going to hold them accountable and, and judge them, he will hold them accountable for their failing to carry out their, their jobs as servants of his in, 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 in human government. Now, this is, a, this is, an, uh, this is how... Uh, now, right now, we see that uh, our, uh, Nebuchadnezzar... He gave, he, to, to execute these guys would be, God would be in agreement with it, except not for Daniel and the other, his three friends and the other diplomats. They're innocent. The only guys under God's law is to be executed would be those occult priests, the witches, the necromancers, and the astrologers. They were worthy of death according to the Mosaic law. Now remember, the Babylonians were not under it. And, uh, but the Jews were. So if we were going to live, uh, have uh, the Babylonians were under God, the Mosaic law, these guys would all be executed and justifiably so. But we see that Nebuchadnezzar, though he was right to, to want to execute these wi other wise men, you know, the witches, the occult priests, the, and the necromancers and the astrologers, he was wrong to execute the other guys who weren't involved in these practices and who were not lying to him like the other guys were. So we see here that we have a farm, uh, we have a ruler, a human ruler, uh, actually ruling unjustly here at this particular time. Now let's keep going. It says he's going to. Uh, Ariok was uh, is described here as appointed by the king, assigned by the king to execute or destroy the wise men of Babylon. Remember the word wise men, kakim. Again, it's, it appears twice here in verse twenty four, and in each instance, it means wise men. It's correctly translated. But who are these wise men? Well, in verse 2, they're, called, they're, they're composed of the occult priests, 
the Kartom, the necromancers, the Ashafs, the witches, Kashaf is the Aramaic word, and Kastim is the word for astrologers. Now, also, it's also referring to the dignita- dignitaries and diplomats and Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. How do we know that? Well, we just read in verse 13 that Arioch came to look for Daniel and his three friends to execute them. Now, they didn't, as I said before, they didn't get engaged in the practices of the, the other wise men. They were innocent, but they were considered wise men. So therefore, we see Nebuchadnezzar gave a very rash order, an unjust order here. He really, when he saw Daniel, as we pointed out, he would be embarrassed by the fact that he had, this guy was going to be executed by his order, and he liked Daniel. So he would be a little bit uh, sheepish around Daniel at this particular time. Now, when it says uh, uh, the word Babylon there, Babel, that refers to the city of Babylon, and again, it's not the province or the empire as a whole, and how do we know that? Well, Verse 14 tells the reader that Arioch, the captain of Nebuchadnezzar's bodyguard, was sent by the king to execute the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, as we saw, would not send only one man to execute all the wise men of the province of Babylon or all the wise men of the empire of Babylon. He'd send multiple guys to do that. So the fact that he's sending only Arioch here means he's just going after the wise men in, in the city of Babylon who would be in his government. Like uh, the president, he has a cabinet. They're housed in Washington. They, they, that's where they make their home base. That's the idea here, that these, these wise men would, that were in Nebuchadnezzar's government, that were part of his cabinet, they were housed in the city of Babylon. Now we, get, uh, we continue forward. It says in verse 24, it says, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. As we know, it's the city of Babylon. And he went in and spoke to him as follows. Now, when he says he went and spoke to him as follows, in the uh, Aramaic, we have the verb uh, azel, azal. It's the pa- pa'al perfect form. It's translated here, he went. And then we have the conjunction wa, translated in. And the adverb kain, translated as follows, correctly. Then we have a verb. We have amar as the, as the f- uh, following verb. It's translated here, spoke. And then we, lastly, we have the preposition lamed, and its object is the third person masculine singular, pronomial suffix who, translated him. Now, azal, the verb here, it means to return, to go back to a place, and it's used here with Daniel as its subject, and it indicates that Daniel returned to Arioch from his home. So the word denotes that Daniel left his home and returned to Arioch. Now, there's something interesting going on here. Remember, Arioch let uh, Daniel uh, go to the king. And what do the kings do? The king said, oh, you want to have a chance to interpret the dream? Give me a chance. So Daniel undoubtedly said to uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, I want to go and pray. Go to my friends. I have a prayer meeting. I want to talk to my God, and he'll reveal to me the content of your dream and the interpretation, and I'll be back tomorrow morning. So what happened was Nebuchadnezzar lets him go. Don't, don't miss that. It's telling us something about Nebuchadnezzar's relationship to Daniel, that he is very, uh, he likes Daniel. Look what it says, and in, uh, in, uh, let's see if we can find it here. It says, uh, look at verse 16. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation of the king. Then it says, without saying that he gave him his request, obviously it, the rest of the chapter says he did, Then verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter. And verse 18 says the reason why. So that they could go to God in prayer and get the answer from God about the king's dream and its interpretation. So don't miss that. So that means Nebuchadnezzar let let Daniel go in his own recognizance. Because if you look at verse uh, verse 24, it says, Dan- Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. Notice it says he went into Arioch, meaning he's never left Arioch's, pre- he left Arioch's presence, which tells you that he wasn't a cu- handcuffed or a- in a prison, that Arioch, under Nebuchadnezzar's order, let Daniel go on his own recogn- recognizance, along with his three friends, to go to God in prayer. So here we have in verse 24, it says that Daniel went, went and spoke to Arioch as follows. It's saying that Arioch, uh, Daniel returned to Arioch, which is telling us something, that Daniel was left on his own recognizant. He wasn't put in a prison. He was allowed to go home. There's, no, there's nothing said that he was chained to anybody or anything like that. He was allowed to go home. And as I told you before, in chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar liked Daniel and his three friends. Don't miss this. Look at verse chapter 1. 
Look, go back to chapter one. Let's see this. Because you've got to put these things together, and especially when you, when you study a narrative. And the Old Testament is filled with narratives. This is a historical narrative. There are prophetic narratives as well. But we see here that when you look at narratives, you've got to be very careful. That's why I say you've got to read the, the things over and over again. I know a lot of people, because of the generation we're in, we think we can read something once and we got everything. Unless you are a, a genius and you have a photographic mind and memory, uh, there's, no, there's no way. You, we need, when you read things over and over again, especially in a narrative, you see these things. So you get, there's a picture being drawn here by ne- uh, Daniel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's telling us, not explicitly, but it's inferred, it's implicit, that he got along with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't against him and upset with him like he was the other wise men. Now look at Daniel chapter 1. Look at the, verse 18. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials, remember that was Ashpenaz, presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked to them. That means he interviewed them. And out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service, which they were trained for for those three years. Look at verse 20. Then it says in verse 20, as for... As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he questioned them about what they knew. He found them 10 times better. That's hyperbole, meaning that's a a little bit exaggeration here. In other words, what it's saying is that Daniel and his three friends were superior. It's another way of saying they were superior to these other guys, the other exiles. So Nebuchadnezzar found them 10 times better than all the magicians, that's the occult priests, the conjurers, that's the necromancers, they try to contact the dead for future events, who were in his realm, in his kingdom. So that's, what is that telling you? Daniel and, uh, and his three friends were not on bad terms with Nebuchadnezzar. Now stop. Then why did the king order them to be executed? As my point exactly, a few, few moments ago, he was a hothead. He got upset. He, he made a rash decision, as some leaders do, unfortunately. He didn't think He should have just had ordered the four groups that were talking to him to be executed, not the other diplomats, because they weren't guilty. They weren't lying to the king, like the witches, the necromancers, the astrologers. Those people, they deserved to be dead. They deserved to be executed. They were involved in treason, really. They were insubordinate to him. And so they they were misrepresenting themselves to him. But Daniel and his three friends weren't. So what this is telling us is that Nebuchadnezzar, his anger... Uh, caused him to have Daniel and his three friends executed unknowingly. He forgot that those guys were wise men too. And if he took the time and thought about it, he would never have issued this order for such a blanket order to execute everybody who's a wise man. Because not everybody who's a wise man was guilty before Nebuchadnezzar. So we see here, if you go back to verse 24, uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 24, we can read between the lines there. It says in verse 24, therefore Daniel went into Arioch. So he, that, when it says went in, it means returned to Arioch. Where did he return from? Home. Who let him go home? Remember, he's under arrest. Nebuchadnezzar let him go home. Go have a prayer meeting. Come back to me in the morning and have, and have the, uh, answer the, the, my demand for me. Fulfill the demand. Tell me the content of the dream and the interpretation. Daniel was so confident, he knew, he, was, he said, Okay, even before he even asked God about the prayer, about the request. That's how much faith Daniel had. He also had the gift, as we saw from chapter 1. He had the gift that he could interpret dreams and visions given to him by God. So Daniel is totally confident that he's going to answer the king's request. And Nebuchadnezzar could see that. You could see it on his face. But he could see, he also could see from his own interviews with him that these guys weren't phony baloney like these other guys he's been dealing with. So he would let Daniel and his three friends on their own recognizance. So when it says in verse 24 that Daniel went into Arioch and spoke to him as follows, that means he returned to Arioch from his own home. So he's not under, he's not under arrest. He's not chained to anybody. And that's, what is the implication of that? He's on good terms with Nebuchadnezzar. So he's not angry at all the wise men, but just the ones who have been in, that are involved in the occult. Who, and by the way, God is angry with those guys who are in the occult because God in his law condemns these these practices of the witches, 
the occult priests, the necromancers, and the astrologers. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar, again, was right to have them executed, but he was wrong to have Daniel and his three friends executed. And when Daniel walked into his presence the first time to ask for time to, to get the, the, the content of the dream from God and the interpretation, you can bet that he was embarrassed. How do we know that? How do you know that, Pastor Bill? Well, just read what we just read. He liked Daniel and his three friends. He'd be embarrassed because, oh man, I like these guys and I was, these guys would have been executed. So he, he, he realizes at this point that he was very rash. And as a leader, we saw this in the past, it's very, it's, it, a lot of times, it's, it's very important. Don't make rash decisions. Whether you're a, a husband or you're a parent or you have a, you're a boss of a company or you're a pastor or the president of the United States or a military leader, it's good many times to just sit there and think about it. Maybe sleep on it. If you're a Christian, pray on it. Don't make rash decisions. I, heck, when I send out emails and somebody you know, if there's some kind of problems with somebody or I talk to somebody and I have to return, respond to an email that's belligerent or something as I've done in the past, I've had to deal with stuff. I sit on it, over, I wait and sleep on it, pray on it before I send it out, when, especially if it's a very volatile situation. And so, because you never want to make decisions when you're, you're a, as a hothead. You never want to, when I say a hothead, your anger drives you to make irrational decisions and bad decisions. So as a leader, it's very important that you're calm, cool, and collected and not jump to conclusions or make rash decisions and, and, and very, be very uh, careful, especially as a leader because your decisions as a leader could adversely affect people if their decisions are bad, like we see here with Nebuchadnezzar. God bails Nebuchadnezzar out here, by the way. So this, uh, it, let's uh, look, continue on because now we see God, uh, Daniel's, uh, the love of God reflected in Daniel's life here uh, which I wanted to talk about in, in detail here this evening. It says in verse 24, Therefore Daniel went, went into Arioch, or in other words, he returned to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of the city of Babylon. He returned and spoke to him as follows. What did he say? Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Now stop there for a second. Who's Daniel and who's Arioch? Cheyenne, who's Arioch? What does that mean? He's the captain. He's the he's the top rank, right? Now, who's Daniel? Remember what Daniel is? No, no. What, 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 what happened to Daniel, Tyler? Yeah. What, why was he? He was a what? A prisoner of war, right? So, would a prisoner of war talk that way to somebody who is his captive, right? Does that sound like somebody who is under somebody's authority? It'd be like uh, it'd be like Tyler going up to his father. Hey, mow the uh, uh, hey, give me some money. <laughs> hey, mow the lawn for me. That ain't gonna happen. All right, it can happen, and you get decked by it. But he's not, that sounds like he's ordering Ariok. This is my whole thing. He's not ordering Ariok. Now, how do we know that? First of all, we know that Daniel is subordinate to this guy. Daniel's a captive of the Babylonian government. He ain't gonna, and plus this guy came to arrest him and execute him. So he's not going to talk this way. The, the New American Standard and, and most English translations, they make it sound like that Daniel's ordering Arioch. That can't be the case. And there's another reason why it can't be the case, and, and, and which will, uh, going back to the original, will we'll benefit from. So do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. In the Aramaic, we, is composed of the preposition lamed, which is not translated here. It doesn't need to be. And it's, it's marking the next word as the object. It's uh, followed by the, the, uh, uh, the construct form of the noun kakim, referring to the wise men. Then we have the word for Babylon again, babel. And then we have the, the negative particle or adverb al, translated here not. And it's negating the meaning of the verb to follow, which is in the imperative form. It's the hafel imperative form of the verb abad, which we saw in the past, not too long ago, a few moments ago, it means to execute somebody. Speaking of capital punishment. Now, this word abad, it means to destroy, to kill, to execute. It's referring to capital punishment, and it's specifically it's referring to the execution of the city of Babylon's wise men. And the word's meaning is negated by the adverb al, which means not, and it's a marker of negation and prohibition. So the two words here denote that Daniel, 
is requesting that Arioch not execute the city of Babylon's wise men because he can reveal the content of the king's dream and its interpretation. Now, in the, in the Aramaic, the word is in the jussive form, the verb abad. The jussive form is used with the negative particle al, and it expresses a desire that Arioch would not execute the wise men because he can meet the king's demands. So the imper the, it's not an imperative of command because Daniel is an inferior talking to a superior, or in other words, a subordinate talking to his superior. So it, and the justive form of this verb means that he's requesting that Arioch not execute the wise men. Let me give you my translation. Let me give you my translation of that particular verse. Listen carefully. Verse 24, my interpretive translation. Because of this, Daniel approached Arioch, whom the king assigned to execute the city of Babylon's wise men. He returned to him, Daniel did, and then said, please do not execute the city of Babylon's wise men. It's a please, not an order. He's requesting because he's, an, he's a subordinate to a, 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 a superior. That's why it's not a command, it's a request. And it's, listen to me, it's a, a great, it's a desire of Daniel that's the desire of God. Now stop here. Didn't you just tell me, Pastor Bill, that those, those occult priests, those witches, necromancers and astrologers who are involved in the occult and things that, practicing things that God condemns in the Mosaic Law, which we studied in the past, why would God want these guys to live? Well, think about this for a second. If God had that attitude, None of us would be here. All of us would be in the lake of fire because all of us are condemned before a holy God. When we study this in Romans, one, two, and three, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're no better than these guys. We, in relative terms, we might be. I mean, th these guys, and if we compare ourselves to them, yeah, we're probably we're more moral than them. But when we compare the whole ba bucket of us, the whole barrel of us, we're all a bunch of rotten apples. Why? Because we're all sinners. We, in Adam, when we were born into this world, we were born into sin. That's what Romans is, is all about in the first five chapters. Because of Adam's sin, his whole progeny fell into sin. He, the whole race is plunged into sin. We were in Adam prior to conversion, and now we're in Christ because of our conversion, our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's be, through the baptism of the Spirit that we're in Christ. So the wise men are guilty before God, and that's very important. They don't measure up to God just like we don't measure up to God. He's holy, that means he's perfect. None of us measures up. It doesn't matter how moral you are because you would, you, you would have to be perfect in your morality. And no one on the face of the earth is except Jesus. And he's on the right hand of the Father now. So the wise men are guilty before a holy God. However, God through Daniel is sparing them. Were we guilty and condemned to death? Do we deserve the lake of fire? Absolutely. Absolutely. But God sent his son to the cross when we were his enemies. What does God's love do? It loves one's enemies. And that's, no one on the face of the earth could do that in their own human power. That's from above. That's God's love. So what Daniel's doing here is astounding because we would expect him, we would expect Daniel to say, the heck with these guys, they're guilty but he actually intercedes for them and expresses the love of God. Even though these guys were worthy of death, he expresses the love of God and requests that they live. Let them live, please. He didn't have to do that, people. He didn't have to do that. So Daniel 2.24, we see here in Daniel 2.24, uh, we see here that the justive mood of this verb uh, abad, to destroy, is used with the negative, the adverb al, and it expresses Daniel's desire that Arioch would not execute the wise men because he could meet the king's demand. Now let's, let's finish off the verse and then I want to speak on the love of God for the rest of the evening. Let's finish off uh, what the passage has to say in the original. In, after the, when, he's, when Daniel says his first request, please do not execute the wise men of, of the city of Babylon, then he says he has another request. Take, he says, take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Now that last request is composed of the verb al-al, -al, translated take into. It's in the hafel imperative form. And then we have the pronomial suffix e, translated me. It's referring to Daniel. And then we have the, the uh, preposition kodam, 
translated to, and its object is the word for king, Malek, again. This is followed by the conjunction wa, and the word pasha, translated interpretation. And then lastly, we have a prepositional phrase that completes the verse. We have the preposition lamed, translated here to, and its object is the word for king again, Malek. And then we have with it the pa'el, in perfect form of the verb, Kava, translated here, I will declare. Now the verb, this time the verb al-al, remember it appeared earlier in the verse, here in this request, this second request, it refers to Daniel's request that Arioch bring him into the, the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. It's used of Daniel requesting access to the presence of Nebuchadnezzar in order or for the purpose of telling him the content of his dream and revealing its interpretation. Now the imperative mood is not an imperative of command. It's a, an imperative of request. It, it's, it's a re request because Daniel is addressing, again, someone who's a, a superior. He's a subordinate. So this word is in the imperfect, uh, the imperative mood. It's an imperative of request and, and rather than a command. And this is, the reason for this is that Daniel is addressing Arioch, who's in a position of authority over him. And it denotes that Daniel is requesting that Arioch bring him into the presence of the king. So it's not, he's not ordering him, take me into the king's presence. It's please take me into the king's presence. That's the idea. So that's, see, my job as an interpreter is not just go off the translation. When the, when the, uh, the inspired text is not the New American Standard or the King James or the Net Bible or any English translation, none of them are inspired by God. Only the original is. So I'm your, uh, as your pastor, I'm supposed to bring what the text says, not what the translation says. Because the translation, though we have great translations and they do a great job, they're not always accurate. That's up for the, and they're sometimes very ambiguously d done deliberately. And they leave it up for the interpreter to bring out what's in the original. So here, we now we're saying that it's not an order here of Daniel. He's making two requests. In each idea, it's please, don't execute the city of Babylon's wise men. Please, take me into the presence of the king, and I will declare, for the purpose of declaring the interpretation to the king. Now, the conjunction wa, when it says, take me into the king's presence, the very next word, and, it's actually the conjunction wa, it's a marker of purpose. And that means it's, the word is introducing a clause that's presenting the purpose of Daniel requesting that Arioch give, an, give him an audience with Nebuchadnezzar. So the idea is this. Please take me into the king's presence in order that I might declare the interpretation to the king. So the word in there is expressing purpose. You could translate it in order that or for the purpose of. Then the word kava follows it, which means to reveal. It's translated in your Bibles, I will declare. So this word kava, it has Daniel as its subject, and the word inter uh, pasha, interpretation, is its object. And it refers to Daniel revealing to Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of his dream. And pasha, again, it talks about Daniel explaining to Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar hasn't forgotten the dream. He wanted the content of the dream so he could, uh, he could be assured that the, his wise men could interpret dreams. He knows what the dream is. He wants Daniel to tell him that in order that he could be sure that Daniel could interpret dreams. And so God gave him both. And now what we see here is in verse 24, we have two requests that Daniel makes. Daniel has made two requests of Arioch. And Arioch, remember, who was, he was ordered by Nebuchadnezzar to execute the city of Babylon's wise men because his occult priests, his necromancers, witches, and astrologers couldn't tell him the, his, the content of his recurring dream. Now, the first request we see here, when he says, please don't execute the city of Babylon's wise men, it's a request not only to spare the occult priests, the necromancers, the witches, and the astrologers in Babylon, but also Daniel and his friends, as well as the city of Babylon's diplomats, and dignitaries who helped to compose the city of Babylon's wise men, since Daniel was of their number. So Daniel is being used by God to deliver a lot of people from death, just like he did Joseph in Genesis. He's, a, he's the man in the gap. He's the man that God's going to use to deliver a lot of people from death. He's not only going to save his own life and his three friends' lives, but and the witches and the necromancers and the astrologers and the occult priests, but also the other guys who, like Daniel and his three friends, were just diplomats, dignitaries. 
They weren't, uh, they weren't, uh, they might have added, uh, they, they, they weren't a part of the occult priests. They weren't a part of the guys who were involved in the occult. They were innocent too. So Daniel's going to be used by God to deliver these guys. Now that's important here because God's trying to use Daniel to reach not only Nebuchadnezzar, but also these other guys who are involved in the occult. And there's a point here. And also everybody in Babylon. This would get around. This is already well known in Babylon at this time. This is big news. This is on CNN and Fox in Babylon. Okay? This is big news what's happening. And here's Daniel, and God's going to use him to save the day. So we have Daniel here. Make His first request is not only going to save the lives of the necromancers, the witches, the astrologers, and the occult priests, but also his, him and his friends, himself, and these other dignitats, dignitaries and diplomats who were not guilty like Daniel and his three friends. Now, notice something here. That Daniel could have requested that Arioch only spare his life and the lives of his three friends and not the occult priests, the necromancers, the witches, and the astrologers. He could have said, those, those guys are guilty before the law. They deserve to die. Forget about them. But Daniel knows God's heart. What does it say? God desires all men to be saved. When we study that in 1 Timothy 2.4, Listen to me, the, the adulterer, the homosexual, the lesbian, the drug abuser, the drug addict, the child molester, think of all the wicked sins that go on this earth. God sent his son to the cross for everyone. That's a pretty astounding thing to think about. That's the love of God. That's the love that God wants us. That doesn't mean that God agrees with the sins of these people. It means that God understands that we're sinners. He did something about it with his son, and he wants to have us into his, into his kingdom, into his family, through faith in his son, and therefore he gets the glory, and we get none, because we're saved on the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross. So is it, this is something that God wants us, the church, to do. Don't we, the, you know, many times I've seen Christians Drive away people, instead of drawing them to Christ, they push them away. And they, for instance, people who are gay or homosexual. You know, yes, they're wrong for what they do, but you've got to understand the big game plan. We want to save these people. And so I'm not saying you have to condone their lifestyles. Absolutely not. Jesus, what did he, it says in the Gospels, he was considered a friend of the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They're called sinners in your, in your Bibles, your English Bibles, but the word in the Greek is talking about people who are prostitutes. So we see here that Jesus reached out to these people. It was the legalistic, self-righteous crowd who thought they were better than everybody else and didn't think that they were sinners, and that those people, they didn't want to have anything to do with the tax collectors and the prostitutes. But Jesus, he reached out to these people. How are you going to save people? For instance... Let's say, for instance, a person who is a homosexual or something like that. They, they have a problem with sin. How are you going to have... You have the solution to their problem. But if you, don't, if you don't try to communicate with these people and you just block them out and don't want to have anything to do with them, then what's going to happen is, how are they going to have their problem solved? The reason why they're a homosexual is, one, they've, con they've rejected God, but also they're a sinner. And their sin nature goes to that trend. The, as a forn, the fornicator, uh, the, homo, uh, the heterosexual, he fornicates, he goes the other way. Both of them are sinners. God was reaching out to people. He's reaching out to sinners. Daniel recognizes these guys are not worthy of, eternal, uh, worthy of anything. They're worthy of death, but he still reaches out to them because he knows the love of God. And God loves sinners, not because there's anything in us that's attractive people. He loves us because of who he is. And he has a plan to save us. So it's not that God condones our behavior because we reach, he reaches out to us. He rejects it. We say that. Read, when we studied Romans, Paul went through a whole thing in Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 that the whole ra human race is condemned before a holy God. Yet then right on the heels of that, now that you know that you're condemned, this is what, this is now what you can do. I'm giving you my son. Remember what the Mosaic Law was all about. Threefold purpose. It, one, it revealed who God was. 
See, sinners like us, we need to know who God is, that he's holy, that he doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't sweep sin under the carpet. It also tells us, it's also, it tells us God's holy standards and it tells us who we are. We don't measure up. The third purpose of the law is to point us to Christ. That's what Galatians 3.24 is all about. It, the law is a tutor to lead us to Christ. It shows the sinner you can't measure up. You can't get into heaven on your own merit. But he is my son. So the law is designed to get us the sinner to despair that he can't measure up to a holy God and thus point the sinner to the person who can save them before a holy God and bring them into the presence of the holy God, Jesus Christ. That's the law. That's what Paul taught in Galatians 3. We study that in Romans, the book of Romans in detail. So Daniel, he was immersed in the law, but he also knew that God loves his enemies. He knew the love of God. How did he know that? Because Daniel knew he was a sinner too. He knew in the Mosaic, in the Mosaic law with the temple worship that he couldn't approach God without a sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So Daniel was taught that along with his friends. So Daniel knew that God was treating him in love, so therefore he was going to treat the, the occult priests, the witches, the necromancers, and the astrologers he was going to treat them in God's love because God had treated him in love. And what's the message for us? We got to treat people in love. We need to give them the gospel. We need to befriend the people. You know, a lot of times, Christians, what they do is they're afraid to get down and dirty with people who would be considered less than desirable to be friends with. You know, oh, I'm not going to hang out with that person. They look funny. They get the, you know, kids who dress up gothic, you know. They, you know, they have the, all these bizarre looking things. A lot of Christians, they won't, even, they won't even talk to a kid like that when they pass them. And you know what? That's not what Jesus would do. He'd say hello. They haven't done anything to you, have they? Uh, I mean, so when we look at people, little people who are, uh, let's say, uh, people who have AIDS or drug abusers, I mean, these people, they need Jesus. They need Jesus. If you have a problem with Democrats, they need Jesus too. If you're a, you're a Democrat and you don't like Republicans, you're, you're a liberal, well, you know what? They need Jesus too. Everybody needs Jesus. We're all broken. Daniel got this. Daniel got this. He said, I, yes, I have a choice. I have the power of these, to execute these guys. I could say, you can let them be executed, but spare me and my friends because I'm the one who's got the answer to the dream. They didn't. They're worthy of death. But Daniel didn't have to do this. He reached out to these guys. Now stop. If you let, put yourself in the place of one of these witches, of one of these occult priests, one of these necromancers and astrologers, and you knew you were on death row, and that day you were probably going to be killed, and here comes Daniel, who has nothing to do with your, what you do, and actually rejects what you do as sin. Here you are being spared by Daniel intervening for you. How would you feel to a Daniel? Thank you, Daniel. That was very nice. That was, you saved my life. All these guys would be indebted to Daniel. So what we should be thinking about is that, is we, we, that pray that God would open up opportunities for us so that we could show love to these people who are unlovely. Because God, he sent his son to the cross for all of us who are unlovely. So Daniel would have been justified to have these guys executed because the practices of these four groups were condemned by God in the law. Yet he pleads for their lives, which was a great demonstration of the love of God in Daniel's life, which was a great reflection of God's, loves, God's love toward his enemies. So God was expressing his love for his enemies through Daniel. Are these necromancers, witches, and astrologers, and occult priests, are they friends of God? God can't, God can't stand what they do. He hates the sins that they're practicing, but he loves the sinner. He hates the sin, but loves the sinner. So we see here that these four groups were the enemies of God led by Satan and the kingdom of darkness. They're involved in the occult. They're in contact with demons. How, so they need Jesus because they need to be delivered from the demons. They need to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. But prior to, prior for, to, prior, 
before we became Christians, we were in Satan's kingdom. Doesn't it say in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, that we were the sons among the sons of disobedience, the unbelievers? We were enemies of God. Yet God loved us. He didn't have to send his son to the cross for us, but he did. Because of who he is, and he is love. So Daniel, God through Daniel, shows mercy and is magnanimous towards these individuals. So the wise men are being exposed to the love of God by Daniel. By sparing their lives when he could have had them executed was an act of forgiveness. Through Daniel, God was forgiving the wise men and giving them an opportunity to repent and obey and worship him rather than the gods of Babylon. God is the God of second chance, third chance, fourth chance. God desires all men to be saved. Why hasn't Christ come back? Because he wants all men to be saved. He's given everybody an opportunity to change their mind about him. And he's patient and tolerant and he is magnanimous to every single one of us. Go to Romans. Hold, uh, you don't have to hold your place. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Peruse a couple of passages about the love of God. Look at Romans 5, 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 1. We study this in detail. Jody's favorite book. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace meaning, that implies that we didn't have peace with God at one point. We were at war with God and he was at war with us. Look at verse 2. Through whom, Jesus Christ our Lord, we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. You know what grace means? Our relationship with God, which we don't earn or deserve. Look at when we get to heaven, none of us are going to be able to say we earned it or deserved it. There's nobody who's earned anything. We, we got in through Christ, Jesus Christ, the Savior. He gets all the glory. See, grace always gives God the glory. Look at verse 3. And not only this, but also we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proving character, and proving character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Look at it says, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's through the teaching of the Word of God. That's how he does it. Who was given to us. Look at what he says in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were a part of the ungodly. You weren't born a believer out of the womb of your mother. No, you were an unbeliever until you believed in Jesus as your Savior. Now look at what he says. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, unique to him. And that while we were yet sinners, remember God is holy. What does that mean? Perfect. Not one flaw in God. God has never sinned. In fact, sin is, we know sin by the fact when we measure it against the God, God's holy character. Sin is defined in the sense that it's defined because it doesn't measure up to holy, God's holy character. We understand what sin is because of God's holy character, which is expressed in the law. It shows us that we don't measure up. So it says in verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us means as a substitute. He went in our place. For much more than having been now justified by his blood, his death, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. We were going to be under the wrath of God, but now we're saved from it. For, while, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. But I want you to emphasize there that God sent his son to the cross for his enemies. When, what does it say? Look at, uh, was it Luke? Look at Luke. Gospel of Luke. Look at Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus on the cross, while they were ridiculing him, vilifying him. Come on down off that cross if you're the Christ, if you're, the, if you're God, the Son of God. Let me see you get off that cross there, Jesus. And they were his enemies. They crucified him. What did he do on the cross? 
Look at verse, look at verse uh, 33. Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, look what he said. These are the people who mistreated him. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots and dividing up his garments among themselves. But notice he said, forgive them. They know, what they know not what they do. Jesus is showing the love of God, his love. He is God that they crucified on the cross. God became a man and ex- the son of God, the second member of the Trinity, not the father of the spirit, but the second member of the Trinity. He experienced crucifixion. That's the hypostatic union. It means he entered into this suffering for us. Think about that. And he did it for his people who hated him. Look at Matthew. See if I can find it for you. Look at Matthew chapter 5, I believe it is. Yeah. Look at verse 43, Matthew 5, 43. I love this passage. Matthew 5, 43, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. You, should, you have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's, of course, hate your enemy has nothing with God. He didn't teach that in the law. He, in Leviticus 19, 18, he said, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Hate your enemy is what the, the Pharisees taught. Look at verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies... And pray for those who persecute you. Everybody in the audience, people. I mean, we're familiar with that because we've heard it said so many times, hopefully. But in that day, they would be stunned because usually it was, (laughs) you hate your enemy. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, what did Jesus do on the cross? He prayed, he practiced what he taught. He prayed for those people who mistreated them. Now, look what he says. Why does he want them to do this? So that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes the, his son, notice it says his son, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Right now, every person who's an unbeliever on this earth is experiencing God's love, which they don't deserve anything from God. Yet here's God allowing to breathe the, his water, or breathe his water, water, to, to breathe his air, drink his water, <laughs> drink his water, wa- eat his food, his animals, all these things are God. Can you imagine that? You giving somebody who hates you and letting him use your house? Think about this. Think about your worst enemy. I'll think about my worst enemy. And letting him have my house, my car, and everything, let him use it. And they backstabbing me and criticizing me and you know slandering me and doing all kinds of stuff and hurting me and I let him use my house and my car. That's what God's doing. We're using his stuff. That's what God does. Now why is he doing it? He's trying to, is he killing him with kindness? Think about it. He's trying to woo him with his love. You think they maybe get, they get it. Look at verse 46. For if you love, this is very important people. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors, they were the despised in Israel because they, were, they went over to the Romans to, to collect taxes against the Jewish people. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Or well, we could say it in our day and age, hey, even gangsters do good things to their kids. Gangsters are nice to the people they like. Verse 47, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you're to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, meaning do what he does. Treat others better than they deserve. Treat them in grace. Treat them in love. That was astounding what he was teaching there. Floored everybody. That's what Daniel knew this. How did Daniel know this? Because it was taught in the Old Testament. Daniel was taught. See, Daniel understood that he was an object of God's love. He didn't deserve a relationship with God. He knew through the animal sacrifices in the temple that those sacrifices taught him and his friends and all Jews you can't approach God unless you have a sacrifice and the sacrifice was provided by God in his love they knew about God's love so you know everybody thinks of the Mosaic law it has nothing to do with God's love you gotta be, we've been studying Exodus we studied Genesis God's love is in there all over the place 
So we have here that through Daniel, God was forgiving his wise, the wise men and giving them an opportunity to repent and obey and worship God rather than the gods of Babylon. So this act of God's love on the part of Daniel demonstrates that he was in fellowship with God. So this first request also makes clear that the wise men were not executed on the spot but were arrested and assembled at a public place of execution. That this is the case as indicated by Daniel in verses 14 and 15 where he is allowed time to ask Arioch a question with regards to his arrest and Arioch responds to this question. If Arioch's orders were to execute the wise men on the spot then Daniel would not have been allowed time to ask her a question, but would have been executed. Furthermore, here in Daniel 2.24, you can go back to Daniel 2.24, and we'll close. In Daniel 2.24, Daniel requests that Arioch not execute the wise men because God had given him the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream as well as his interpretation. And that would make clear that the wise men were not executed on the spot, but were about to. Now, the second request where he says in Daniel 2.24, please take me into the king's presence in order that I might reveal the interpretation of the king, that appears not to meet the king's demand. In which he, remember he told him, give me the content of the dream and then, and the interpretation. I kept, in the, when we were studying it, we were reading it earlier in the evening, what he kept, I kept on putting in there, the content of the dream and the interpretation. He wanted both. But it doesn't act, the second request here, where Daniel says, please take me into the king's presence in order that I might reveal the content of the dream and the interpretation. No, it's not there. It's just the interpretation. Why did Daniel leave that out? Does that imply that Nebuchadnezzar didn't require this of Daniel? No. It doesn't imply that Daniel, it doesn't imply that Daniel was not required to make known the content of the dream and only its interpretation because Daniel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, leaves this out for the sake of brevity, which is the same reason why the text doesn't say that Arioch granted Daniel's request. Does, he, does it explicitly say that? No. How do we know he, did, he granted the request? We see it later on in the chapter that he did. Now the following verses that follow verse 24 make clear that Arioch did grant Daniel his request just as the rest of the chapter makes clear that Daniel made known to Nebuchadnezzar both the content of his dream as well as his interpretation. Furthermore, if Daniel knew the interpretation of the dream, he certainly knew the content. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work with what is taught this evening and that we would learn and apply the things that we've uh, studied here this evening about your love that was reflected through your servant, Daniel. And, and we just thank you, Father, for this study in Daniel 2.24. Again, we pray that it will be a blessing to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to your Son and yourself. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.